Welcome back to Radio 54, Season 2, Episode 2. Now let's start with this, another beautiful technology f up. Did you know that the world's biggest communication platform may no longer be available on your smartphone? This is f***ing ridiculous. Now, if you own a smartphone that costs you upwards of, say, $800, well, you'll have to get a new one because the f from WhatsApp, that's Facebook, I mean Facebook, have decided that millions of smartphones, both Android and iPhone devices, which only support uh, outdated operating systems, will no longer be able to run the app. WhatsApp said the move was necessary in order to protect the security of the users. Bullshit. It's because you now have to buy a new phone and thus the big business companies make more money. Because, let's be honest, these guys own the world. The world. Soon, there will be kids on their knees praying to this. Can you imagine? It's crazy when you think about it, and I know you're not an absolute shock at this blasphemy coming out of my mouth or my warped up, f***ed up view of the world. No, you're like, yeah, that's probably gonna happen. But I wouldn't worry too much because iPhones are made here. And this is the place that's home to this. China is battling a new and rapidly spreading respiratory virus. This is the epicenter of this novel coronavirus. The numbers needing medical help in Hubei province are growing. Let me break it down for you simply. In a note to investors on Monday, TF International Securities analyst Ming Cho Kuo reduced his first quarter iPhone shipment prediction by 10% to a range of 36 million from 40 million devices due to the coronavirus outbreak. Kuo says his firm's checks reveal disruption in Apple's supply chain that could extend into the second quarter if coronavirus mitigation efforts don't take hold. For those of you who've been living under a rock for the past month, the coronavirus looks like this. The death toll from the outbreak continues to climb in China. The new coronavirus virus has killed at least 425 people and infected over 20,400 in China as of early Tuesday. More people have now died in this epidemic than the SARS pandemic of 2003. And it's spreading like this. Now, a third person has uh, tested positive in the UK for coronavirus. There are three new confirmed cases of coronavirus this morning in the US south of San Francisco. A third person has tested positive for the coronavirus in the south Indian state of Kerala. Hundreds of Australians are currently trapped on that cruise ship anchored off Japan uh, with doctors working around the clock to stop the spread of the coronavirus on board. Because these f can't stop eating these. Welcome to the candy shop. Candy shop. I let you the Go ahead, girl, don't you stop. But seriously, folks, the coronavirus is highly contagious, a highly contagious respiratory illness that was first discovered in Wuhan, China, and has now taken the lives of more than 360 people in China, as the number of confirmed cases has grown to more than 17,000 worldwide. To stop coronavirus, China has all but shut down areas most heavily affected by the outbreak. In response, companies have also closed, stopping production of their goods, and countries have closed their borders with China because Fong Li thought eating a bat would be a good idea. So fearful is this world of ours regarding the virus that the Malaysian government has had to come out and say that the virus will not turn the infected into zombies. And they said this on social media as medical authorities seek to contain the virus. Some social media users in Malaysia made a connection between the disease and the f***ing walking dead. Malaysia's health ministry dismissed the rumors stating that the claim that individuals infected with this virus will behave like zombies is simply not true. And patients can recover. Man, the internet is so, so good. Now, speaking of the internet, and what it was intended for, and what it was intended to be used for, yes, we switch our focus now to pornography. And my buddy Zeke. That's right, our bromance has been going strong for a number of years now, and each morning when I'm on air at 98.4 Capital FM with Amina Abdi Rabar, I know exactly what will and what will not break the law. What happens is many people, and I'm not gonna name any names or point out people and call out names of radio stations, but many people think that they can get away with saying what they want on air because they think it would be funny not to respect the laws of a country. Irresponsible journalism is a problem worldwide. But in other countries, when you f up, it's not a joke. To call yourself controversial, and all you do is talk about put ass, dick, and fuck. Well, that, my friend, is not creative. It's actually cheap and easy. That is why this happened. Most radio stations that are notorious for adult discussions in the morning 100. Keep in the cabello. 105. Get radio. Radio. Very notorious as well. Shame on you. That's pretty 
fucked up, right? And you wonder why they call me controversial and someone who speaks his mind, yet I'm still on air and my station has never been questioned. It's simple. I know the law because I took time to read the law. I suggest more personalities do the same. Now, speaking of reading and understanding, let's delve into the BBI or the Building Bridges Initiative. Let me give you some facts and then you can make up your mind as to whether you want bridges built or you'd rather swim in the abyss. I realize that over the years, I've been getting my information from various online news sources instead of reading the material myself and presenting the facts. Well, that changes today right here. So here's what I've gathered from the BBI. The BBI was a result of the March 2018 handshake between Uhuru Kenyatta and Rilo Dinga. The BBI was undertaken in order to effect change that will transform our trajectory, our social and economic system, and the way we're governed, if we are to avoid catastrophic national failure. Now, President Kenyatta formed the Task Force on Building Bridges to Unity uh, Advisory with a mandate that is to consult citizens, leaders, institutions, civil society, the private sector, and religious sector, and other stakeholders to recommend to him solutions that he will share with relevant institutions and processes the major challenges Kenya's identified. One, national ethos and values. Two, extreme poverty and hunger in parts of the country. Three, youth and neglected left out of the national agenda. Four, self-harming politics. The big five, corruption. Six, ineffective devolution. Seven, excessive government spending. Now, the biggest issue that affects really all about these points is the ugly word corruption. BBI aims to do the following to help tackle ground, make all wealth declaration forms open to public scrutiny, promote whistleblowing by giving rewards of 5% of recovered proceeds to persons who give information on corruption deal or, or rather corrupt deals, protect whistleblowers, enable court procedures that guarantee the protection and the safety and the security of the informants. Whistleblowers and witnesses, particularly regarding terrorism, serious transnational crimes and corruption. Good in theory, but it's about the practice. So let's see how far we go and if this actually works. Final note on BBI, by the way, for me is that of running mates. This is great. The running mate of every candidate for the position of governor should be of the opposite gender. Gosh, we're becoming so progressive as a country, aren't we? Pretty soon, we'll be talking about Kenya's first transgender politician. Stay tuned, because there could be more on that later. Now, remember the good old days when this guy and this guy couldn't stand each other? Attorney Kimweta Kimondo, Nation Leo Mumesema, is a bully. That is what the man is, a bully. <laughs> Yes, there was a time that it would be insane to think of these two being in the room together. Now, they holiday together. It's crazy. These two best buds have created the country's most beautiful bromance. And I, for one, think it's great. If you want to show your feelings, then you should be able to. And thanks to the BBI, it's happening. It's really happening, man. They even go to concerts together. So is it Raihuru, Miginga, or Diata? Man, you can suggest a Brangelina-type name if you want on any of our social media handles. So as they jet off to the USA together for their um, Valentine's tour, we want to celebrate their newfound friendship. I don't know much, but I know how to love you. And that may be all I need to know. And finally, some sad news. Zay Daniel Arab Moy died at the age of 95. Now, making the announcement uh, in a presidential proclamation, President Uhuru Kenyatta said the former head of state passed on in the presence of his family. Moy is one of the last in a chain of African strongmen who ruled in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and who were forced out thanks to multi-party politics. Loved and hated in equal measures, the late President Moy was often dismissed as a dictator by his uh, critics, and his 24-year reign, however, we choose to remember him as a leader and a symbol of Kenya's past and its struggle with independence. May he rest in peace. When we debated at Kazaran, of course, Wananji did not want to move into multipartism. And I urged them to do so because of pressures. Those who are fighting to be president suffer from a sense of self importance. <laughs> I was not a dictator. I was saying exactly the fears of the people. Mariam's on the way next, and we will see you next week. 
For this week's episode, I want to talk about so many things because who knows how long we're going to be around with coronavirus. I mean, a new strain has already been discovered in the UAE, so you know that is mutating. And I would not want distinguished members of the human race like yourselves going extinct without knowing the absolute nonsense that is happening. Perhaps these stories might even show you why it's actually about time that the human race went extinct. I am kidding, or am I? Okay. First off, who is Dama? A Ramandi who drinks Changa while in transit to prison in a police van? Or the police officer who will somehow have to explain to his superiors that he left four prisoners unsupervised in the back of a van with barrels of Changa? Wool up, wool up, wool up, just wool up. While your mind overheats trying to figure out who is the dumbest of them all there, here's some background. Four suspects in criminal proceedings are currently receiving treatment in Maragua Sub-County Hospital after consuming Chang'a in the back of a police van. That is a real headline. The suspects were being transported from Kigumo Lokot to Moranga Prison pending determination of their cases when officers allegedly left them in the back unsupervised with Chang'a that was meant to be an exhibit at the court. When it was finally time to hop off the prison bus and get cozy, as cozy as one can get in prison, officers were bamboozled when they found all four suspects unconscious. Apparently the reason this Chang'a was so special it had to be transported to court was its potency. This liquor sounds like it's strong enough to knock out two mammoths or the equivalent of one Farid. As always, I have a lot of questions. One, wouldn't a sample of the Chang'a have been sufficient as an exhibit in court? I mean, what was the judge supposed to do? Taste it and like see for himself? Second, who on earth leaves prisoners unsupervised with illicit brew in the back of a van? Are they just begging to get fired? Then again, this is the 254 and that might just land them a promotion or an elective post. Complete disregard for the law isn't just a Kenyan thing though, it seems to be universal, like the love of music, good food, the need for companionship, or the coronavirus. Last coronavirus joke, I promise. But I am really glad that like your favorite pop artist world tour, this disease has chosen to skip Africa. I digress. I was talking about fellas who are choosing to take a huge dump on the rule of law and tear up the pages of the constitution to wipe. Like Spencer Boston, 20, who was recently in a Tennessee court over a simple marijuana possession charge. Spencer could have taken a plea, posted bail, been home in time for afternoon tea or an afternoon blunt in his case, but he chose not to. He instead chose to do the Gen Z thing and start lecturing the entire courtroom on the various reasons marijuana should be legalized. I think it's very unfair, the marijuana law here. Um, I think we the people deserve better because marijuana is a very harmless drug and it's been around for ages since the 80s and 90s. But just like in the movies, every courtroom rant must end in a grand gesture. So Spencer reached out into his pocket, pulled out a fat blunt, followed by a matchbox and lit it up. He even managed to get a few puffs in before security realized what he was doing and tackled him. Now, if this story sounds familiar to you, it's because something similar happened last year when a Kenyan man turned up in court accused of possession of marijuana. Moses Wailua then chose to plead guilty to the crime of peddling marijuana instead of possession, which would have gotten him a lesser jail term. Why, you may ask? Because Moses in turn accused the police of stealing 15,000 shillings from him, as well as 188 rolls of bang. Moses said he had the money and 200 rolls of bang on him when he was arrested, but the officers only booked him for possession of 12 rolls. Moses said he was willing to serve life imprisonment as long as the officers returned his money and his weed. These two stories make me feel that drug tests should be mandatory before suspects in marijuana-related charges go to court, because clearly, suspense on Moses has the cause me shuka. <coughs> Lastly, not everyone is a self-destructive dumb There are still truly altruistic people out there. Like this Ethiopian Orthodox priest that is raising money to build both a church and a mosque in the Oromia region of Ethiopia because he feels that building just a church would disappoint God. He has since been reaching out to Muslim leaders who can vouch for him and has collected 6,200 USD towards his cause. In his own words, our faith is different, but not our love. If that doesn't make you feel warm inside, you are broken and I suggest you find a way to expose yourself to the coronavirus. Last one, I promise. As we leave, on the morning of 4th February 2020, Kenyans woke up to the news that the country's second president, who ruled for 24 years, Daniel Toritich Arap Moy, had died at 95. Reactions are ranging from straight up elation to mourning. Which begs the question, how honest should we be when mourning our dead? Let us know in the comment section, how blunt is too blunt? 
We would love to hear from you. From us, though, it's a wrap like Moy for today. We'll see you next time. It's a wrap, come on, it's a wrap.